Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen an increase in stress, anxiety, depression, substance use, and elevated numbers of suicidal ideation. The pandemic accelerated the adoption and expansion of telehealth services and reduced barriers to providing virtual care. With an existing shortage of behavioral health clinicians and an increase in the need for mental health treatment, the use of digital solutions can improve access to timely care. And some recent studies have shown that effective use of digital solutions can improve outcomes as well as optimize the bandwidth of existing behavioral health clinicians. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hetterly with AHA Communications. In this podcast, Rebecca Chickey, Senior Director of Field Engagement and Behavioral Health Services at AHA, is speaking with leaders from Alina Health in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin about mental health and addiction services and key digital innovations the health system is using to provide behavioral health care to patients throughout the pandemic and beyond. Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. As Tom Hatterley said, my name is Rebecca Chickey, and I'm the Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services at the American Hospital Association. I am joined today by three wonderful speakers, and I want to give you the opportunity to meet each of them. I'm going to give their titles for the record. One, we are joined by Dr. Brian Palmer, who is Vice President and Clinical Service Line of the Mental Health and Addiction Services at Alina. Joe Club, who is Vice President of Operations and Clinical Service Line Mental Health and Addiction Service. And Helen Strike, who is President of Regina Hospital and River Falls Area Hospital. It is my honor also to say that Helen is a member of AJ's Committee on Behavioral Health Services. So first today, Joe, can you speak to your role in the mental health services offered by Alina Health? Happy to do that. Thank you, Rebecca. As Rebecca stated, I'm Joe Club, and I serve as the Vice President of Operations for Mental Health and Addiction at Alina. I lead in partnership with Dr. Brian Palmer, the clinical leader, as I serve in operations. Alina Health is the largest provider of mental health and addiction services within the state of Minnesota. We comprise ourselves of 250 inpatient beds. We have 12 emergency departments that cover the state. In addition, we advance care in what we call our intermediate levels, that is partial hospitalization, day treatment, and outpatient addiction services. We offer 450 chairs um, in this intermediate level of care. We have five specialty mental health clinics across the state. In addition to the specialty clinics, we are integrated, co-located into 48 of our Alina primary care clinics. Very excited to be able to offer these services across the state, and we provide these services to the lifespan. So we serve children, adolescents, adults, and seniors. Joe, that is phenomenal. What an incredible, comprehensive set of services that you have. I'm going to turn now to Dr. Brian Palmer. Brian, can you tell us about your role at Alina's Health and what you do in terms of the mental health and addiction clinical service line? Thanks so much, Rebecca, and thanks for having us here today. This is um, enjoyable to get to speak with you about what we do. So I'm a psychiatrist by background and have been in the vice president role at Alina Health this year. I followed Paul Gehring, who's known to many AHA members, and we are pleased to have such a comprehensive set of services. I think one of the things we've realized over the last year was how we were able to shift so quickly. Over about a three-week period, we moved our entire operation to virtual, actually 94% of our appointments became virtual at the beginning. We've moved that back to about a hybrid, maybe around 60% virtual, and we're expecting a long-term goal of 50%. But that flexibility to move the system, to change the way mental health care was delivered, really kind of accelerated several other approaches that I think we're gonna talk about today to embrace digital solutions to problems we have in mental health care delivery and really accelerated a lot of exciting advances for all of us. That's great news. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Alina Health is using digital innovations to meet the mental health care needs of its communities? Sure. There were two areas we identified where we wanted to explore digital work. 
the first was around improving access to treatment by allowing upstream psychotherapy services. So services for people with mild to moderate illness who may not need in-person services may be able to be served on a digital platform. And so that was the first area we started to explore. The second was, could we drive care quality in our emergency departments around suicide-specific interventions to lead to stabilization in the emergency department and decrease the need for inpatient admission and increase the quality of the care we provide? So you've mentioned two themes here, meeting increased demand and driving value. Can you tell us how digital solutions improve access to treatment? Maybe we can first start with the Digital Cognitive Behavioral Treatment, or CBT. Tell us about that. Absolutely. So just to take a step back, since I know not everyone on the call lives in a world with cognitive behavioral therapy and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy addresses the cognitions and the behaviors that can become patterns over time that fuel changes in mood. And it turns out that if you can learn to change your cognition and change your behavior, you can pretty meaningfully improve your mood, especially for mild to moderate symptoms. And so we partnered with a company, Silver Cloud is the vendor we selected. There are several good options in this space to develop a a comprehensive approach where the platform can be prescribed in primary care. And we limited this to primary care and we're really trying to drive upstream intervention. What we learned in the process was we needed to get clear internally about what is medical treatment and what is something that's good for everybody to have. And we took the position that if you're prescribing cognitive behavioral therapy for an illness, regardless of the platform, we need to consider that medical treatment. And so we work to have the coaching for the platform be provided by our team internally. We have about 40 master's level clinicians that are embedded throughout primary care And they serve as the coaches for the Silver Cloud platform so that they have a line of sight to whether the patient is making progress, whether the patient is not doing well. In fact, if they stop engaging with the program, we cut off their access and we send them back to primary care to work on a new plan. So we've really tried to have a tight connection and make sure we're not contributing to further fragmentation of the healthcare system, but instead really leveraging the ability of people to um, provide line of sight to a greater number of patients and clients over time. So not only are you using an app, but you're also using your own clinicians. What was the purpose of that? Did it have anything to do in terms of trying to address concerns around care fragmentation? We made an intentional decision, really led by our our medical director, Dr. Palmer, to integrate and and support the Silver Cloud uh, modules with a coach. Some organizations will deploy this out independent of a coach, but we felt very strongly that these uh, mental health consultants that are clinical social workers are existing team members that are integrated into our primary care clinic. So they have established relationships with our primary care providers who order Silver Cloud. They also, their role is to understand connections. So they understand how to connect individuals across our continuum of care. So within that coaching role that they play, they are able to assess and identify if an individual needs to go to a higher level of care. Maybe they need to go to inpatient therapy. Maybe they are in a crisis and need to have a mobile crisis team go to their home and provide an in-home assessment. It could be an ED visit, but that was a very intentional decision by Alina Health is to couple this with our own internal coaches that understand the continuum and how to make those connections. Let me just say from a personal note, I very much appreciate that. I have a family member who uh, initially was uh, receiving treatment and, and through CBT, and that seemed to work to a certain point. And then that clinician who was working with them, this was outside of an app, but that clinician said, I think DBT is what you really need. So that ability to be able to connect with a live person along with someone who, something, an application that can be there 24-7 if you need it, seems like a wonderful balance of things. So, Dr. Palmer, it sounds like you're saying that for the majority of the patients right now, you're using coaching. But are there opportunities or ways in which really uncoached applications can be more effective? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. And so, it has helped us to get clear about what's medical treatment and that the coached 
application is something that we use for people that are screening in with mild to moderate depression or anxiety that we believe need a line of sight there. At the same time, there are good applications out there that are good for all of us that frankly we could put in the water and help everyone have better mental health, learn to get a hold of your sleep, work on mindfulness techniques to be able to be present in the moment. That's good for everyone's mental health. And so the platform we have is actually going to allow us to separate out a series of uncoached modules that we'll be able to share with Alina Health patients broadly as part of our commitment to whole person care at Alina. I also understand that you're deploying a digital tool to address safety and drive value for individuals in crisis through your work in suicide prevention. Dr. Palmer, I think this question is for you. Can you tell us about that approach? Sure. And to do so, let me just take a step back and share that over the last several decades, we've learned a lot about suicide intervention. There was a time where we considered suicide to be a function or a symptom of, say, depression. And if we could just treat the depression, the suicidal urges would improve. And while that could be true for a subset of patients, what we now understand is that what we need to do is intervene on a given person's suicidal process to understand the mode that their brain gets into where they can't see other options or can't remember times where they felt connected, where they can't see the future, and to recognize that as a patterned way of experiencing the world that is likely to happen again, and that if we can help the patient learn about their own process and intervene on that, we can drive a lot of safety and use healthcare much more effectively. So we partnered with a group called Jasper Health. It's led by Kelly Kerner and Linda Demeff. We're both national experts, very respected people in the field of suicide prevention. And the platform allows a patient, in our case in the ED, to go through a process of their own reflection on their process of becoming suicidal, to participate in a guided interview about that process. And then from there, they can interact with people who have lived experience which is something we've always wanted to be able to provide and never been able to really do, but they can via video hear from people that have been there about what that's like. It's a potent and powerful way to help somebody in a crisis. They can learn skills. So some of the skills that your relative may have learned in the DBT program are skills that we have on the app and we can help the patient in the ED be able to learn some specific things to lower their distress. In fact, we can measure how much their distress lowers in the course of the ED. And then they build a crisis stability plan that they can access on their own device from home and all their work is uploaded into the electronic medical record so there's line of sight to what they're working on. And what that allows, we have talented clinicians 24 seven in all of our EDs. What that allows is the clinician to leverage their time with the patient. So they come in with the patient having already done a lot of this pre-work and then they can really make sure their interview is focused on how are we gonna work together to develop a plan to best intervene for your particular situation. We make sure we do lethal means counseling for every patient because that's all included and it really helps drive evidence-based practice in our ED. So lots of thoughts going on in my head. First of all, I will say on a personal note, the opportunity to see others visually who have already gone through this really resonates with me. My family member for the first time went to an intensive outpatient program and came back and said, I'm not the only one who's had some really tough experiences. It's not just me. And so the ability to, particularly in a time of a very highly transmittable pandemic, the ability to always go to group therapy sessions or an intensive outpatient is not always there. So this ability is really intriguing to me. I wanted to know, as you mentioned earlier, There are so many apps out there. I'm sure you went through a very rigorous, thoughtful, multifaceted review process in order to land on what was best for Alina and for the community and the patients that you serve. Can you tell me, are there some principles that you would suggest could guide others when they're trying to make decisions around um, digital innovations and the use of them in mental health? Joe, do you want to take that? I could speak to um, the selection process. So you are right, Rebecca. There are many, many vendors out there that are offering these digital solutions. I'm going to speak to the cognitive behavioral therapy approach. And so we did go through um, a discernment process and evaluation 
So like many organizations, we looked at a number of factors. We looked at cost, certainly, as one factor, but we also looked at, um, I think what attracted us to the Silver Cloud company is the component of coaching. They would offer us coaches, so we could have purchased that coaching role from them. And we were really intrigued by that, but um, we did make that decision to actually utilize the internal coaches or our mental health consultants. I have to tell you that the Jasper decision has been a many-year relationship with the line of health. I know that prior to my arrival, I know prior to Dr. Palmer's, these were conversations and an engagement that was developed through one of our um, ED psychiatrists within the organization and Dr. Paul Gehring over years. And they hung in there with us for a very long period of time to um, get to this place and grateful for their patience, but really excited about the ability to um, launch uh, this uh, digital tactic within our emergency departments. So if I heard you correctly, one of the things that you looked at, particularly with the Silver Cloud, is the elements, any elements in that application that would allow you to address potential fragmentation of care. That the coaching component and your desire to make sure that you had an ability to continue to connect with the patient was fundamental and would be one of the elements that you would encourage others to look at. Absolutely. There are many companies out there that would encourage you just to deploy these out. Some of these companies are are selling this product to employer groups and that's in saying, you know, send these out to your employer groups. But we felt for the population that we serve that um, it was important to actually um, offer the coach. I will also say is that and time will tell as we continue to expand. We just recently have expanded now. We started with six clinics deploying this. We're now to 12. Just learn today that we're actually ready to even go further uh, across Alina with this. I would say that absent uh, a digital modality for patients, I would uh, say that we probably over referred into psychiatry and we're, we would be overburdening a very expensive resource, which is precious in all organizations, and probably over utilizing some of the in person therapy or even some of the telehealth therapy. So we'll continue to evaluate that. But as most organizations struggle with their lead times into psychiatry and therapy, I'm really new that we could not hire ourselves out of this access problem. We needed to offer other strategies to meet the need. Well, I'm sure for those listening who are in the behavioral health field, all of this is resonating, but particularly that last statement, we can't hire ourselves out of this challenge right now. And there are many um, solutions. There's not going to be just one. But I want to I want to go back before we, I think, go to the last question. I just want to say, so the, the care coordination was something that was important to you, if I heard you correctly, in the selection process, as was trust in the product. And for you, some of that trust came from an established relationship or a, an established relationship with someone who really one or ones, doesn't have to be one person, who really knew the developers. Did I capture that correctly? You did. And they were engaged and willing to work with us to help develop, co-develop over time. I think that's where the confidence comes into advancing the Jasper strategy. Well, as we draw this to a close, I have the quintessential question, what does the future look like, right? So Joe, Helen, is there anything you'd like to say about the future of behavioral health and beyond? Maybe I'll just comment a little on what behavioral health and emergency departments need to, needs to be different. And these two products are a perfect example of, as Joe said, we can't hire ourselves into our ED access problem and beds. And so I think we're thrilled to see these new um, modalities of care that are going to be able to keep patients, to have them be able to uh, be supported 24-7 should they need it, uh, and be able to be kind of a watchman kind of uh, thing for, for this situation. We all know that suicide, when a patient enters into our emergency room with, this, with suicide ideations, it creates an immediate care team around that patient. And having a different way at which the um, outcome for that patient can be, I think can be uh, extraordinarily valuable. So we're very excited to see over time how that changes our use of resources 
and our patient outcomes, which we really hope show us that patients are better being cared for in their own home. Your words remind me of a phrase that came from, I think, 1965 and the Community Mental Health Center Act uh, that was passed somewhere, I think, in that year, if I, if I remember correctly. And that is the importance of allowing people to be cared for in the least restrictive appropriate level of care. So it is amazing to me that it was back in the 60s that that language, I think, was um, at least publicly used more frequently. And we went to the moon. So it's taken us this long to get to the point of, of being able to use that technology to help us achieve that goal. We've tried to work towards it in many other ways, but it's nice that we're continuing to fight this fight. I thank you so much for your willingness to share your journey, your insights. I thank you most on behalf of the patients that you're serving, that you are willing to okay, now I'm going to do the moon thing, take one giant leap for mankind in terms of offering and, and really challenging and innovating in this field. Well, I'm keeping you from being the good caregivers that you are, so I will let you go. And I thank everyone for listening. I encourage you to check out the AHA Center for Health Innovation website at the aha.org forward slash center, as well as aha.org forward slash behavioral health for a wide variety of resources, integration, community partnerships, reducing stigma, and reducing deaths of despair, all of which the tools that were described on this podcast today are trying to do. Thank you so much.